I would like to invite Professor Samuel Estreicher from NYU. He's a very good friend of the Honor Academic Center and a very good friend of Israel. Professor Estreicher is the director of the Center of Labor and Employment Law in NYU. He wrote lots of articles and books and there isn't enough time to tell you all about the things that he does. Welcome and thank you very much for being here today with us. First of all, I'm um, very proud to be here because I think Ono is a very special institution in Israeli society. I see the mission statement and uh, it should be applauded and, and given more publicity within Israel and internationally. What I want to talk about, uh, and I want to thank Shlomit uh, Ravid, who's a great friend and unbelievable powerhouse of energy. I don't know how she does everything she, she does. We, uh, we owe her a great deal, a debt, a great debt of uh, gratitude. I want to talk today about safe harbor as an approach to thinking about uh, achieving anti-discrimination objectives. In general, and the, the approach of the law is uh, you treat individuals as individuals, and uh, even if you think as an employer uh, that you're going to have difficulty uh, with certain people in the workforce, you have, to, you have to overcome that initial reluctance, hire the person, get used to using the person and uh, uh, it'll be a success story. The person will be uh, in, the, in the workforce and people will be accustomed to seeing uh, black people, uh, women in different roles. Historically, in the United States, uh, African Americans, blacks were, were only hired for certain positions. The fear was that uh, if they were hired for public contact jobs in the, in the railroads, for example, that the public wouldn't accept it. And the basic th thrust of, uh, of the anti-discrimination law in the United States was to tell employers, no, you must hire, you must place uh, African-American workers. And to a large extent, uh, the companies have been better off for it in the United States. They've been forced initially to hire uh, from uh, disadvantaged groups, including women. The argument with women was not so much public, content, public reaction. The argument with women was they wouldn't be committed to the workforce. You hire them, and then they would get pregnant and they would leave the workforce so you would not be able to recoup your training. And again, the basic approach of the anti-discrimination regime is no, you have to treat women as individuals. If they're as qualified as the male worker, you've got to uh, treat them the same and if they're more qualified, they should get the position, they should get the promotion. And to a large extent, this also has been a success story uh, in the United States. So the basic idea of the anti-discrimination law is that the reluctance that employers initially feel can be overcome. Uh, and, and to some extent, you need the law's command to sort of force the employer to uh, undertake uh, uh, such hiring objectives. And then over time, you, you, the race or the gender of the person will no longer be important. Now, I know there's still a glass ceiling issue with respect to promotion for women across the world. Uh, and there are gender, uh, gender pay issues that continue, but by and large, it's been a success story. So the idea is we, have a, we use a standard. We say, thou shalt not discriminate. You must treat individuals as individuals. You can't make assumptions about their, their background. And if you treat them that way, uh, over time, what you thought was a cost, what you thought was an obstacle, over time is overcome. That's the basic story of the anti-discrimination laws. There are areas, and I'm speaking primarily from the U.S. experience, but I think it's worldwide, there are areas of, of chronic non-utilization, of chronic employer aversion to hiring. Uh, and those are the areas I want to focus on because those are the areas where I think the continued insistence on following only the anti-discrimination principle uh, leads to a dead end. So I'm talking about areas where no matter what the law says, people in these categories will not be hired, will not be placed by the employer. So the examples I have in mind are workers who are older, who uh, maybe they've retired, or maybe they're just, they've been laid off. We call it reduction in force in the U.S. context. And they're looking for new employment. And the law says, treat the older worker the same as you would any other worker that's applying for you. Uh, and uh, the, f the factual reality, the de facto reality, is that these workers are not hired. Now why are they not hired? They're not hired because the, uh, the perception on the employer's side is they're going to be very hard to place in this new environment. Uh, these may be people who've been very successful in their prior work. 
They may have done very well, but this is a new environment. There are new tasks, new technology. In all likelihood, the older worker is going to have to report uh, to a, uh, younger supervisors. Those problems are seen as insurmountable. And as a practical matter, I'm being very pragmatic here, they're not hired. Even though the law in the US context, I'm sure in other places, uh, says thou shalt not discriminate. And uh, employers, if they're ever caught, uh, they might be penalized for, for not hiring from those groups. But the de facto reality is they're not hired. So if they've been a long-term employee with another employer, in most cases, these people are not in the workforce. Or if they're in the workforce, they're in the workforce as independent contractors, may not be as fully utilized as they could be. So that's a problem in the US context. I think it's a problem worldwide. Uh, another category uh, of employee uh, would be uh, someone with a disability, an obvious disability, who needs costly accommodations. So think, for example, of someone, I've actually, I know this situation in, in, you know, uh, directly, someone who's a very able lawyer. Uh, he was a Harvard-trained uh, uh, lawyer. He worked for a great number of years at IBM. There he was in an advisory capacity, and uh, IBM provided readers for him. In other words, people were on staff as readers to read to him the legal text. And, um, in the role that he had at IBM, he was fairly successful. Not super successful, but fairly successful. At some point, uh, he was uh, eliminated, his position was eliminated at IBM, and he's now in the workforce, and he wants to be a lawyer in a law firm. The problem is, the law says, thou shalt not discriminate, and the law also says, thou must accommodate. Now, accommodation is like be beauty. There's a whole spectrum of accommodations. Some accommodations are a very de minimis cost, and employers can incur them readily, but other accommodations are very expensive. So for example, hiring a reader is like having to hire someone at a half year salary full time for that employee. Now the law can say all it wants, thou must not discriminate against the older worker, thou must, and it, the, the accommodations must be provided unless it's an undue hardship, but as a practical matter, this gentleman could not find work as a lawyer. He was very smart and a Harvard graduate because the law was saying to employers, even though, there's a even though there's a cost associated with this employee, an accommodation cost, you must ignore it. The factual reality is that folks are not hired, they're not utilized. Another example would be individuals with a, a record of a, having been a prior convict. Maybe they committed a felony, a violent crime in the past. They've uh, completed their, their, their sentence, they've completed their prison sentence, and now they want to be reemployed in the society. Problem is, for employers, they are going to see risks associated with hiring that person uh, because of the prior uh, violent background. If something happens at the workplace, uh, that employer will be uh, liable in tort, at least in the US context, for having hired someone who had a violent background. So the, 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 the reaction of most employers is to not hire that individual. So I've given you three examples. Older workers who had long service with prior employers, second example, people with, in, with visible disabilities where the cost of the accommodation is significant, ongoing, and the law says ignore it, and a third would be uh, individuals of, uh, with prior convictions. I can add a category in the Israeli context with certain uh, Arab workers for certain positions uh, where you're going to associate with the hiring of that worker a certain number of uh, problems. Now, I'm not saying that employers should be risk averse in these circumstances. What I'm saying is they're going to be risk averse in these circumstances and there are limits to what an enforcement regime can do. There are limits of resources in every society and what they're going to supply with respect to enforcement. Discrimination on the hiring stage is extremely difficult to detect because you know very often you sent your application you don't know why it was rejected. No one tells you why it was rejected. And you know, we just go on and look for other work. Extremely difficult to bring these hiring cases. Even in the United States, which is a very litigation-friendly world uh, with class actions and all that. So as a practical matter, the cost of non-enforcement for the employer is low, and the risk of engaging that worker is high and continuing. Now what I want to offer in a very limited capacity is that we start thinking about, we who care about anti-discrimination goals. We who want to advance equality. This is not an argument from the right. This is an argument from the advancement of, em of employment equality. For a limited period of time, 
uh, employers should be given a safe harbor to encourage them to hire these chronically underutilized workers, chronically underutilized groups. I call it a safe harbor. It's a temporary safe harbor. Safe for two or three years, the in individual will be hired as a probationary employee. And after that two or three year period, whatever the law says, um, the person becomes a regular employee. But for that insulated period, for that probationary period, the employee can be let go without cause and without consequences to the employer. What is the argument? The argument is to overcome what is a kind of rational aversion to hiring these people. You give employers the safety of understanding that for a limited period of time they can experience that worker, have actual concrete experience with that worker, and see if it in fact can be a satisfactory uh, relationship. Safe harbors. Now, safe harbors is not such an unusual concept. We see it in lots of places in the law. In fact, it's a growing concept, but primarily has been used for technical areas. You know, we have certain, in, for example, in the pension area, we have certain tests, it's a mathematical formula to find out if you are, uh, you're giving highly compensated employees too much of a role in, in participating in the benefit plan. There's a formula for that. In technical areas, there are safe harbors. I'm suggesting in this area, the fundamental area of whether they're going to hire certain people, that agencies be given the authority to promulgate safe harbor rules that for a limited period of time, that individual can be hired with, and can be fired, let go, within that period of time without consequence. Now, this is something that would have to be very carefully done. That should be done through a process of rulemaking where there's a notice, and because it can't be routinely done. But we know there are certain areas that the law has not been able to actually encourage, to actually promote, to de facto promote the hiring of individuals from those groups. And this is where I think safe harbor approach can, in fact, promote uh, anti-discrimination goals. It would have to be, it would have to be a time barred. It can't be forever. Be a limited period of time. Now, some people say that this is an approach that. Uh, disserves anti-discrimination values, waters down anti-discrimination values. I don't see that because it would be limited to areas where, in fact, uh, these individuals are not, they're chronically underemployed. There's a chronic employer aversion to hiring or selecting these people. And it would be for a limited period of time, and at the end of that limited period of time, uh, there would be full uh, uh, treatment as a regular employee as any other employee, a limited period of time. Some people say that uh, this approach is wrong because employers will game the system. I also don't understand that. In most cases, employers, when they hire people, even for, under this safe harbor, they're taking a risk. They're not going to game the system for the benefit of a two or three year period. So I, th I actually think, in the words of Jane Fonda, who's my, the great philosopher in the US context, that this is, he, she said, no pain, no gain. I say that this is an area where there is gain and no pain, which is contrary to, to James Fon Jane Fonda. Because I think that if we, we should promote this concept within limits to deal with our areas of chronic unutilization of certain uh, minority groups. And I think in the Israeli context, the Arab worker in certain occupations uh, would, would fit that uh, prescription. That's all I have. Thank you very much.